And that is very much the go-to submission for Alex Morono. Huge win for him tonight. I like to stand and bang like the good Lord intended. Alex, the great one, Morono! Here he is in the UFC, and he's a winner this afternoon at the Apex. We expected it. We expect to win. I, I trained that whole camp expecting to win, no matter who it was. Damn, the determined Argetta! Please tell me that's on video. I've never been happier. I'm made for a fucking podcast. We're <laughs> dangerous. Listen to me, we're out of here. Welcome to the UFC Unfiltered. As you can see, Matt Serra. Matt Serra right now, not here, John. Um, thank you, John Morgan, for filling in. Um, is on. It was he did. I think Rogan yesterday. So he's on a plane coming home today, which means it's shitty weather here in New York. Matt is probably on a really uncomfortable, bumpy flight. That's what I'm thinking. Matt is right now miserable. Well, I'm telling you, what, what I'm hearing is that he's big time in this. Is what happened there. You know what I mean? He, he goes and does Joe Rogan and just pushes us and here at USC Unfiltered to the side. What's up with that? No respect. Yeah. How about you get an early morning flight, Matt? How about you hop on the six a.m. <laughs> What do you, hey, Joe might want to have lunch. And all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> fuck us. Um, so, yeah, he's probably on a, you know, on a, a very uncomfortable flight. We have uh, Alex Morono and, uh, and uh, Dan Argetta uh, on the show today. I think Alex Morono is in the uh, wedding room. If we want to bring him in in just a moment, fighting Court McGee on uh, Saturday night. Uh, this Saturday, really, really interesting uh, main event. It is uh, Brendan Allen against Chris Curtis. Um, really, and, and poor, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to Dan Argetta coming off two. Have you, have you talked to anybody coming off two no contests in a row? I don't know if I've seen that. Man, that's not something you see very often, right? I mean, and you just wonder about how, what that does to you, especially the way that it happened, right? Like one, it was a, a loss that was overturned. Okay, was that's fine. Yeah, exactly. Right. But the other one was like a fight that he, he should have won. And so to, to have that kind of taken away from you, man, I mean, that's got to be a little bit frustrating because, man, you're in there because you love to compete, but you need those wins to move your career forward. So, yeah, really interested to talk to Dan as well. And it's one of those things. And, and you can bring in um, Alex whenever you want, uh, uh, Jake. But it's one of those things where Keith uh, P uh, Peterson was the ref, and it's such a blatant fuck up. And he looked like he knew he fucked up. It was a uh, hey, Alex, how you doing? Wow, well, what's going on, guys? Good. Yeah, we we're just talking about a referee mistake, um, uh, where he thought that. Uh, do you remember the name of the fighter, John? It, it was against Dan Argetta. I can't remember which which fight that was. I'll it was that uh, uh, Lonnie. Um, oh, oh. Uh Lawrence, Ronnie, Ronnie Lawrence. Lawrence. Lawrence, Ronnie Lawrence, yes. Ronnie Lawrence, yep. Ronnie Lawrence, and uh, he thought, Keith Peterson thought that he tapped, uh, but he had, Keith had pulled his hand back, and when he resisted, his hand hit the guy's back, but it wasn't a tap. Have you had anything like that happen in your career where not necessarily a, a, a win that becomes a no contest, but but a, a terrible, terrible moment with the ref? Uh, well, so kind of. One time, I have a, I have a, oddly enough, I know it's like topically appropriate, I have a win on my record from somebody getting disqualified from biting me, which sucks. I hate that's such a weird blemish on my record. And sure enough, once it happened the other weekend, everyone was tagging me and stuff. Right. But in the rules meeting, he was like, if you guys scream on submissions, that's a verbal, you know, it's a verbal tap. And in the first round, I armbarred this dude and he started screaming and the ref didn't stop it. So like he survives the round, round two happens. He bites me in round two. Then going in round three, they see a big old bite mark on my chest. And then end up disqualifying him. But like, had the ref called it in round one, I would have had a submission one, which would have been way better. But no, I'd say like one of the worst ref mistakes was actually a, in a Fury main event with Edgar Chires. He actually fights in the UFC now, but he put a guy to sleep with a triangle, and the ref didn't know he was asleep. So Chires transitions from the triangle to an arm bar. And while this dude's arm is getting wrenched on, he wakes up and then tries to fight the arm bar and then taps. And I was cage side commentary for that like talking the fans through the nightmare scenario. So right. that was a weird part of, but I mean, weird stuff does happen. And when you're bitten, like that's such a crazy street fight and every fighter knows it's illegal. So it's almost like when you bite someone, you can't think you're going to get away with it. It's not like putting your hand inside their glove. Like you can't think you're going to get away with that. Did you ever talk to, to uh, uh, talk to him and ask him what the fuck was he thinking? 
No. So I, I actually learned um, sometimes like pre-fight, I would bring some real energy, would like stare them down and like bounce. And I was just getting myself hyped up. And I had noticed it would sometimes make my opponents try to like match that level. So I think it made that fight more intense than it needed to be. And it was kind of a crazy fight. Um, and what was funny, it was in a ring, like an old rickety ring. And I'd actually like deep half guard swept him to his back. And when I swept him, he like tossed himself under the ropes thinking it would get reset. And it did get reset, but with me on top. And he takes his mouth guard out to argue with the ref. And the ref was like, no arguing, go back in the middle of the ring. You know, your bottom half guard, I was top half guard. And, and I didn't realize my coach realized his mouthpiece was still in his hand when we started grappling. Like I go for a guillotine, he gets on top and like locks on and bites my chest. And in the fight, I knew I got bit, but I didn't think illegal. I, I remember yelling like, what the F did you just bite me? And his coaches were like, Let, stop, stop, stop. And like the fight keeps going on. And I end up, you know, doing some ground and pound and the round ends. And then I go into round three and I'm like, what, the, what is happening? And then the, the referee comes up to me and he's like, and he looks at my chest. He's like, did he bite you? And I'm like, shit. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Left was like puzzled. And I, I heard him go to the Texas commissioner at the time. And he was like, hey, he bit him. What do we do? And the commissioner got stern and he was like, disqualify him. And then when I heard that, I was like, oh, well, this fight over. That was weird. I Oddly enough, I had a rematch with the guy, not even on purpose. I had seen a post on Facebook. A promoter was like, hey, short notice fight at 180 pound catch weight. And I like hit him up. I was like, hey, I'll take this fight. Who's it against? And sure enough, it was the same guy. So I think Rashid Abdullah, tried. right? Yeah. So thankfully I triangle choked him in round one on the on the like inadvertent rematch. And he and he was cool after that with me. He oddly enough ended up sucker punishing the promoter and getting arrested. <laughs> oh, no, wow. so, so he's yeah, a guy whose emotions know. get the best of him and have cost him. Oh, oh bad. I'm surprised they let him fight more than once. I'll never forget my mom is the nicest lady. I'm like a suburban kid. And she, so she thinks every fighter is like me. And she's like, Ali, where do you find these guys? And I was like, mom, we fight in the cage for a couple hundred bucks. It's not going to be the classiest of individuals every time. It was really funny. Like I still tell that story. I still tell that, story, tell that story to my guys. Cause like, Hey, like, you know, have no expectations. Like expect them to do some dirty stuff. Cause it can and will happen. Alex, you you grew up in the uh, in the Texas regional scene. You talked about it there, right? Like I'm a fellow Texan, like you. So what what are, what's the craziest venue you ever fought? I mean, that's a pretty crazy story right there. But I know what the Texas regional scene in 2010 was like. It's not exactly the UFC. What's the craziest place you remember fighting in? So for pretty much all of my amateur and even a few of my early pro fights, I was I was I had to, I fought at some bars that I wouldn't have been able to get into had I not been fighting. Um, but man, thankfully, Mick Maynard had run Legacy. It was called Lone Star Beatdown at the time, and he was always a good promoter. So the venues were usually pretty nice, especially once they went to the uh, Houston Arena Theater. But um, I'll tell you, some of the weirdest shows we went to were in Louisiana. My head coach, when I first started, was from there. So we had some connections with uh, Louisiana promoters. And we fought in many like outdoor rodeo arenas where our warm-up rooms would be like a stall with like dirt. And, and horse poop on the ground. I mean, a lot of those, but thankfully nothing, nothing ever too bad in Texas. And like, I'd say the worst ones were the promotions that were not legacy. And then thankfully we got fury right after, like I headlined Fury's first show and that was at the humble civic center. So like, man, I got lucky. I had legacy and fury coming up. So I had mostly good experiences. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I want to ask you one thing. You know, you talked about the mentality of a fight, like the, the psychology of the face off and all that. One thing I've always loved about you and respected about you is like your honesty with yourself and with us, right? Like you'll come back to the media and be like, look, I'm not going to be a champion, but you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to be the best version of myself and I'm going to go put on some great fights out there. Right. But normally when I think about fighters, I think about like, you almost have to have like an unhealthy level of self-confidence. Like you almost have to believe that, that you're the greatest guy, even if you're not. But I guess, when did you kind of adapt that, you know, idea of like, I'm going to be honest about who I am and where I am. And, and how do you think that benefits you? Cause it seems just atypical of what you normally find in a fighter. Yeah. I think it just comes down to kind of how like I process information and make decisions. I just, I love statistics more than anything. And I just look at things logically. This is my 20th fight in the UFC. You know, if I was 19 and 0, then there, there, there's, there's, you know, a very hard case for champ status, which is cool. And so I get to fight by fight, you know, basically. If I'm on like a six or seven fight win streak, which I'll like die to try to achieve, then sure, the goals will readjust. 
But like as of right now, I had kind of like a volume goal. Like it was funny, my 20th fight was my goal. Now I have like a 20 wins goal, you know, with a win on Saturday, it's win number 13. So I still got some work to do. You know, it was really cool. I just, I don't know. I'd like stats and I like the numbers. And so I just, that's how I make my decisions and try to live my life. And it's proven very well for me. It takes a lot of emotion out of a uh, decision-making and, uh, and like, I'm a very optimistic person just by nature. Mm. So like, if it's a 50, 50 chance to win, I like my odds. If it's a 10% chance to win, I can make it happen. But, uh, I always try to like, you know, weigh things in, a, in an appropriate favor. It, it makes me for a bad gambler and a bad investment, you know, for, <laughs> was trying to find angles to make it work but thankful my wife is like a realist she's very smart and experienced so anything like that jeopardizes chance or funds i let her make those decisions you you said something interesting too about how uh abdul abdul, abdul like this last time, had had uh, gotten because of the intensity of the stare down and it's like i as a, a you know i've been watching ufc for a long time and you very quickly realize that the toughest looking guy doesn't always win like and a lot of i'm surprised that somebody was affected by that negative like you know fader always looked like he was watching a cooking show when he was being introduced it was never menacing it was always just kind of quiet and staring and then you'd see somebody put on a face and it, it just doesn't seem to matter so the fact that somebody was affected by that and allowed that to cause him to do something so crazy probably goes to the, the, the mental state he was in because you said he punched a promoter. So that shows you that Dana was right to cut Severino, who I felt bad for. But if someone makes that decision, then they'll make another bad decision in a fight, whether it's that or some other bad decision. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it was funny. On the fight where I got bit, it wasn't really a conversation. But like my corners were like, hey, do you want to try to continue this fight? And then I was like, honestly, like what if he get my eye out? So like the fact that I didn't have a choice made it easy. But yeah, oh, that's that is absolutely. If someone like doesn't have the control to follow the rules, especially something as serious, as, you know, eye pokes and biting, then then yeah, hundred percent. But uh, man, it's just uh, it's interesting the psychology. Sometimes I would, you know, I was always just an intense guy when I fought. I loved. I that's my favorite part about the fight is like the walk to the cage and the actual feelings like that. I realized I had a fight that I lost actually, and I was like, why do I do this? I had to really dig deep and like figure out why do I put myself through all this stuff. And honestly, it's, it's for the experience, especially for like the psychological and emotional experience. I think that's the most value I get out of these fights. It's just like a crazy way to live life. And, uh, and we've had guys who, uh, who kind of psyched out their opponents in fights. So their opponents would start to talk to them. They would be like, oh, you know, you're so strong, nice choke attempt. And my coach who's sitting right next to me, we'd be in the corner. And be like, why is this guy talking to our fighter? And like, wh what's funny is I tell my guys, I'm like, hey, I want you guys to be as intense as you need to be. I was like, but I need you to kind of hide it before the fight start. I was like, be calm, be cool, be collected. Don't give any information. And when the fight starts, then put like a crazy pace and intensity on. Because I don't want any other opponents to try to like, you know, get to that level. You know, it's just it's kind of like a cool, it's kind of like in, in warfare. Like give them no information, you know, or sometimes give them misinformation, but don't give them good information. And I feel like that's something that I would do inadvertently in the past that I've tried to kind of quell since. And I'll tell you, my last fight at the Apex against Buckley, I was like a little bummed it was at the Apex. And I was like, I'm going to make this routine, get in and get out. So like my warm up and my walk was kind of dull. And I feel like my performance was lacking because I didn't have that really cool emotional and psychological spike. So I was really actually happy to get booked at the apex again so I could run that back. So I'm really going to try to feel all of the feelings during the warm up, And I really want to feel the walk and then feel the intensity of the fight. I'm really excited to, to do this again on Saturday. Alex, I wonder if you're excited also. I mean, I know you've always been a fan of kind of fighting the legends, right? Cerrone, Pettis, Means, you know, you were always on that legend store. Court McGee's got to be one of those guys too, right? I mean, number one, a guy, how do you not like Court McGee as a human being and what he's yeah. gone through? And I think somebody that probably approaches fighting psychologically a little bit the same way you do as well, where it's like, you know, we're, we're going to be respectful and then we're going to go out there and then we're going to bring the intensity. So talk to me about this matchup. I mean, your excitement for it, number one, and and just what you think of Court as, as, a, as a fighter. Yeah, when I fought Means, you know, he fought Matt Brown. It was, you know, four, four vets, I, I being the least, you know, tenured vet in that quad. But I had met him actually in North Carolina and like he just said, what's up? And I was like, hey, it's good to meet you. And then I actually saw him yesterday and I was like, Court, you know, what's up? 
I looked forward to the scrap. You know, we gave each other like the old bro hug. And it was funny, Roger, the UFC guy was like, see, that's how fighters should interact. We don't care either. But no, yeah, he's a vet. He's been in there forever. You know, this is my 20th UFC fight. I think it's his 23rd. And, uh, and again, you called him, man. I love fighting these vets, especially while they're still here. Cause like you guys are noticing there's a big cycle change in the UFC. It's, it's like life, you know, guys come and go. And like, even on the main card for Saturday, like I know Damon Jackson and Alex Hernandez in the main event naturally, but some of the other guys, they've only had, you know, two or three fights in the UFC. So, uh, yeah, I love getting these vets while they're here. And, uh, and yeah, man, court's been in the mix for a long time. You know, he's 39, you know, I would be, I would be grateful and happy to still be fighting at 39. So, you know, this was one of like the best fight camps I've ever had. Thankfully, it was just a good one. Like no injuries in incredible shape. And honestly, like the Buckley camp was a great camp. He was a Southpaw. So I feel like I refined a lot of things and got in great shape, but I didn't really get better. In this fight camp, I did a lot of wrestling and clinching and everything. So I feel like my, my grappling, oddly enough, got much better. And like my last hard Saturday before this fight, I had a few guys from a couple different gyms bring, bring their fighters, their black belts, and I just had a dynamite day of jujitsu. And then we sparred after and felt really good. So I'm excited to really mix it up in this fight. I think it'll go absolutely everywhere. And of course, he'll stand and strike, but he'll definitely clinch up and grapple. So I'm excited to play that full that full MMA regiment with him. You know what I'm interested in too, the apex, when you hear fight, especially, I mean, during the pandemic, it was one thing because it was empty, uh, but the sounds there are probably so different when you're fighting, what you're hearing, what you can hear from your corner, what you can hear from his corner, so much different than fighting in an arena. Has that had any effect on you at all? Um, not necessarily. I feel like I'm pretty good at listening to Coach Safe. Um, the only thing is in a crowd, if somebody gets hit flush, dropped or whatever, then you can't hear anything. But honestly, if that happens, you're kind of in like kill mode or survival mode, depending on who gets hit. Whereas at the apex, you can still hear everything. Um, I'll be honest. I do prefer the crowds because I was talking about enjoying that pre that like during the walk and pre fight energy. And it's definitely more electric with a big, with a big fan base. Sure. But again, like the apex is cool. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm happy. I'm actually happy this one for the apex because I want to run that back. I think this is my seventh fight at the apex and uh, I doubt it'll be my last. So I want to make sure to like really be able to like dial that rageometer and tune in to the best kind of dial where I perform my best. And I feel like I, I, I misdialed last time and it wasn't the dial was broken. Like when I fought cowboy and all those other guys at the, at the apex, I felt great. And this one, I tried to make it too routine, and that's not what this is about. Alex, you, you mentioned Coach Safe Saud there. Uh, talk about your preparation. Are you still making that trip? Because I know you've got a lot of responsibilities as a gym owner, and you're passionate about that, right. and that's in the Houston area. Meanwhile, Fortis is up in Dallas, you know, a, a big state to be driving back and forth across. What's, what's your preparation process like that? Are you, are you still making the trip up to Dallas uh, in your training camps? Yeah, the beginning of each week, I go to Fortis and I get my rounds in with Coach Safe. My boy, Ramez Brahima, he's actually got a fight coming up in May, and he fought court. So he was one of my main training partners. They got the crop of all those super strong wrestlers. They got a couple welterweights that like should be and will be in the Contender Series this year. Um, Julius Holmes, he headlined two Fury shows and got two subs. And then Jacoby Smith, he's solid. And Kyle Kretschmer, so I've been working with all those guys. been a lot of fun. So then like, I'll train early at Fortis, get my rounds in, come home, recover for a day, and then do all my, you know, my, my late week training. So I'll go to war. They got Trevin Giles and Zach Reese. I've been training with those guys. Then naturally everybody at my gym, a lot of good, good a lot of good guys. Um, and uh, yeah, I just kind of do that for six weeks and then it's fight week. And I've been doing that for a really long time. I think I've had more fights now in the UFC with Fortis than not. So that's definitely become more routine. And the drive's not that bad. I usually don't stop. It's like a two and a half two hour, 45 minute drive there and back. And, uh, it's, it's not the worst. I was in Dallas and Houston actually uh, a few weeks ago and I did do the drive Dallas to Houston. I did it overnight. Um, a lot of Bucky's stops, a lot of stops <laughs> yep. eating shit, food, jerky, things I shouldn't have been. I don't know how you breathe down there. Maybe you're used to it, but my, the no, I went from Oklahoma city down to, uh, Dallas down to Houston and my breathing, I don't think I've ever been to a place where I couldn't breathe uh, because of like whatever it does for allergies. I'm sure you're used to it, but do you hear that from people? They say it's one of the worst places in the country for allergies. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, I, I, it's funny. My wife jokes. Cause like during the allergy season, she'll get some like runny noses, but I'm like permanently 
just kind of gunky, but I'm, I'm used to it. I was born here. Um, it was so funny. One time uh, I had my boy Cameron Graves and Jake Heffernan fight on a legacy card in Beaumont. And uh, he had fought one guy from Colorado and they were thinking their cardio was going to be really good. But we had swamp air down here and those guys were breathing pure water and they seemed to kind of fade. So we make a joke like we like the humidity. I'm very much so used to the humidity. And I actually prefer like here in Vegas, like we're going to I'm going to hit two workouts today and watch. I'm going to get chapped lips and cotton mouth and maybe a bloody nose tomorrow morning. So I got to make sure to stay super hydrated. But no, it certainly does have um, its humidity and like the pollen count. I think since it's so humid, like uh, our sinus cavities will like maintain moisture. So there's pretty good you know, chance of like some bacteria growing. But like anything, man, you get used to it. And then you prefer, like, I like the heat and I like the humidity. I don't think I'll ever move out of Houston. Does that do anything for your cardio? Uh, you see, you're breathing in swamp air. Do, does that help cardio at all? Um, does that do anything for it? I've never heard that, but again, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe. I mean, I, I like fighting in Vegas. Like, today I'm going to hit, like, a pretty heavy lung blowout. My, my UFC debut was in Vegas, and I, I didn't know. And so after the fight, I like almost puked just from like lactic acid. I remember I, it was just like my lungs were killing me. So now I get that heavy like lung expansion a couple of days before the fight. So come fight time, I'm used to the more arid climate. But uh, I don't know. I don't know the science behind it. So I'm not going to go fire off some, you know, nonsense, long facts. But uh, I, I, I like it. I mean, it seems to benefit us in Houston for sure. What's the most tired you've ever been uh, in a fight? Is there, is there a moment you can look back on and go like, like the, 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 it was the worst you felt or not even bad conditioning, but just where you, you, you maybe blew out your uh, you know, an adrenaline dump or something? Man, um, Matt, you got any feedback on that one? I got my strength coach. He's been with me for every single fight since I was like 18. Physically, the, the third round against Buckley was a little rough. Okay, yeah. So maybe the third round against Buckley was tough. But also, man, I don't. I broke my hand. It's healed up 100% naturally. And uh, so I was just on some weird da damage mitigation. Um, honestly, not, not really. Uh, that fight was more like trying to navigate around the broken hand. I had like a weird cut on the inside of my lip. No one could see it. Right. But I thought that was a weird one, too. Um, from a weird glancing blow. It's so weird what hurts you in fights. Like I get it flushed, no big deal. Weird glancing knuckle on the bottom of my lip slices the inside of my mouth open. Um, so that one really wasn't fatigue. Honestly, no. I mean, back, man, I'll never forget. It was my 11th pro fight. So I had all my amateur fights, 11 pro fights. And I took a guy down in Legacy with a trip. And I was in his guard, all tense and squeezing like I did. And I felt him relax and exhale and it clicked like an epiphany. You can relax and fight. So every fight prior to that, remember I said, I was like really charged up and intense. Yeah. I was so stiff and tense. And every punch was a hundred percent and every grappling exchange was a hundred percent. So I would, I would kind of gas in the third rounds, but that's because I was just too intense. I never had yeah. that moment of relaxation, but no, thankfully I'd say my UFC debut um, I took that on like less than two weeks notice and I had a cut on my eye, so I wasn't really able to do much training. So I did some running, but thankfully, so that fight was in January. I had a fight in December for the legacy title and I, I was in shape for five rounds. So thankfully that fight camp was so intense and my cardio was so good. It actually carried over like the three weeks that I had off and I was ready to fight, you know, three rounds, but I went three rounds with Noak and uh, by the end of the third, man, I was pretty tired, but but that's maybe the worst I've felt cardio wise in the UFC. But thankfully, man, I can't really, I can't really uh, think of any notable fights where I've gassed, which is nice. Yeah. Well, Alex, look, I mean, uh, really interesting fight against Court McGee, who everybody likes. Um, and and you, you've never lost two in a row. So you're coming off a loss. So whatever it is you do, whatever mental uh, strength you have to write the course very quickly, uh, you've done really, really well in your career. So it has not seemed to affect you or it, maybe it seems to motivate you or whatever it does. Yeah, motivated for sure. You know, I like court, but uh, man, I was motivated in this in this fight camp. And then, like, even against Buckley, I was like supposed to be very technical. Like, don't brawl, don't make it crazy. And ah, uh, man, I'll be honest, I like getting a little crazy in there. Now, granted, I'm gonna be technical in this fight. You have to be in the UFC. But, like, I'm ready to really, really throw down and, and clinch hard and grapple hard and punch hard. So, I think usually after a loss, it is 
motivation in camp. And I think this fight camp was so successful because every training session, it was to improve and just increase that chance of winning in the octagon. I mean, I really am ready to rock and roll. I'm very excited. I'm, you, I'm always excited for fights. This, I am particularly excited for Saturday, man. I, I want to I wanna go make weight and I want to experience everything and make the walk. More than anything, I want to start my warm-up, make the walk to the octagon, and then step inside the octagon. Like, that's what I'm waiting for. And the fight is like a reward for all of that fun. Well, have a great fight, Alex. Always good talking to you. And uh, I, again, like John to echo what he said, love how honest you are. And you don't hear that from a lot of uh, fighters, that level of honesty. So it's great to hear from you. Um, and uh, always love watching you fight. Good luck against Court McGee on Saturday night. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you again, okay? Good. All right. Be good, Alex. Yeah, that is interesting, John, when you hear guys talk about I you know, I like to hear guys talk about being afraid too. Like, because they all are. This you can't be in a fight with some guy who's a really great fighter and not feel something. So I love when fighters are honest about being afraid and how they manage it. I, I do too, man. And that's one thing. I mean, look, Alex Morono has proven himself as a guy. That, like, if you're a hardcore, you know that guy. It's going to be an yeah. exciting fight every single time. But, yeah, he's so well-spoken about it. And I'm like you, man. I, I love hearing that. I think that's one of the greatest things about this sport, to be honest, is because I think all of us as, you know, guys on the outside that aren't getting in there do it, we're like, man, these – these are like superhuman people that are just built differently in their structure. Like, no, man, they have all the all the same, you know, concerns and fears and whatever. I mean, it, Cowboy Cerrone was one of the first guys that I remember really talking about it. I mean, he's that anybody, anytime, anywhere guy, right? Yes. But he would always say, you know, I'm in the locker room before the fight throwing up and saying, well, why do I do this to myself? My <laughs> God, what am I doing? But as soon as it's over, I want to go do it again. I think when you realize that it's just so inspiring to understand that like, no, man, they have all the same thoughts that you do. They just find a way to overcome all that and to say, you know what, man, I'm, I'm going to beat this, you know, and not let those things intimidate you. And I think as, for us on the outside, man, you can use that as motivation to do things that, that you're intimidated by, or that you're scared by in life. So I love that part of the sport, man. And, and Cowboy's a fucking maniac. Like he showed me footage. We were doing it. Was, I was in some in Vegas with Matt one time and he had footage on his phone. Of, he's a pilot. Um, and I think he flies like s smaller planes or whatever, but he was going straight up in the air and kind of letting the engines cut and then drifting back down. And then they have to start. He is nuts. But what a high, what a high level of dopamine you need to, to you know what I mean? When you, when you, when you have to do that to feel like really crazy and excited. So he leads a very full life, um, uh, to, to say the least. Um, what do you, what, what do you think about this, uh, this uh, this uh, Curtis Allen fight. I mean, I love Chris Curtis. I mean, I love Allen. It's it's kind of hard to not like these guys. It really is, man. It's 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 an interesting one, right? Because Brendan Allen was supposed to be facing Marvin Vittori, and Brendan Allen has kind of been that dark horse in the division, right? Like crawling his way up and trying to be considered among the elite. But the top of that middleweight division has just been kind of set because you got a lot of big names up there. I mean, you look at Adesanya, you look at Whitaker, and now you've got, you know, the new names in there with Trickus Duplessis and Strickland Emerge. And so you yeah. have these familiar names, but then you kind of got that next tier of guys that's ready to get up there. And, and Brendan Allen is one of those guys. And I think the opportunity to fight Vittori was a chance for him to maybe break into that group. Now, I don't want to take away from Chris Curtis at all because I think it's a dangerous fight, right? Chris Curtis is one of those guys that it yep. doesn't matter if he's stepping in on a week's notice, a day's notice, an hour's notice. Like, you know he's ready to fight. And so it's almost like a like a trap fight for Brendan Allen, right? Like, did you lose a little bit of focus because you're not getting to fight the higher-ranked guy that you thought you were? You know, this is a man that you faced before. And so what? What's so I'm really, really intrigued by this because um, it's still a big spot for Brendan Brendan Allen. It's a main event. You know what I mean? And you win here, you get that opportunity on the mic, you get the media time, you get all that. Um, but, you know, Chris Curtis, man, it, on any given night can beat anybody in the division. So I'm super intrigued by this. Yes. And, and, and you're right. It's one of those things where how do you mentally go into it? Do you, is it a letdown because you're not fighting? It's just the number. It's not a disrespect to Chris. Kerr. It's you, you no. fought the guy and it's the 14 compared to, I forget what Vittoria's rank, but he's, he's, I think he's top six, right? Top or top 10. Right. Um, who was it? It was on. I want to say it was on uh, Hibas Nama Yunus. Who fought and lost to uh, an unranked opponent that I think they took the fight on late notice. I, I'm, I'm, there's so many fights, but I remember before the fight thinking like you're taking a risk by doing this 
fight. And again, I always go back to Frankie Edgar, Brian Ortega. Like when he took a fight, he didn't have to take it. It cost him a shot against uh, Max Holloway. I can't remember what fight it was. It's driving me crazy. Well, uh, but you're right. But you take a chance every time you get out there, right? Because those rankings, let's be honest. I mean, you had the top 15 rankings, but everybody at the UFC level is a killer. And if they're, sure. they're able to step up. So, and it's it's honestly why I think you have such respect for guys that are willing to face people below them, right? A lot yep. of times you're going to say, I'm, I'm not going to fight down, you know, I, I, but to, to recognize like, no, I need to give that opportunity. You know, I need to give a chance to people because, you know, somebody gave me that chance. So you respect that. But yeah, you, you always do wonder now. You know, with Brendan Allen, obviously, he's got the opportunity to, to to get a little bit of revenge there. So maybe that one is going to keep him motivated in it. You know, it's the it's the last person he lost to is Chris Curtis. So, you know, maybe that'll keep him fired up. But you just never know because you had a plan of where you thought you were going to be. You've been fighting for this respect. You've been fighting uh, to get recognized as a top contender. Does that change anything? So um, I'm intrigued by this one. Look. It's natural that everybody's already talking about USC 300. I feel like this card might go a little under the radar this week. 100%, weekend. Just, sure. And then that's natural. But I, I do think if you really dig into it, there's some fun matchups on the card, and I, I think there's some intrigue in the main event. And and you can't, like, with with, with uh, 300 coming up, one of the things UFC does so well, and I was, I was thinking of this when we were talking to Alex, is, like, boxing. I mean, again, for boxing fans, fine, but I, I, I just don't care about boxing anymore. And even when I do watch something, yes, I'm going to watch Jake Paul Tyson. Of course I'm going to. But I don't care about the, the, the fucking fights leading up to it. And what UFC has been so good at is developing these fighters on fight nights and these smaller cards where they have something every – it's not always a pay-per-view 300 level, but it's, it's there's good enough fights and exciting enough prospects – uh, where you watch them and the prelims are good and, and the early prelims are good. So they're really good at building talent very quickly uh, because they're on these fight nights and you don't have to wait for these giant cards to hopefully catch them on a, on, on a prelim. No, it's it's crazy. I mean, you look at boxing, and obviously the big boxing fights are fun, but you know, you go sure. to the undercard of a big boxing match, and there's nobody in the arena. There's no media there. I mean, literally nobody, an empty arena until the main card and maybe even halfway through. Meanwhile, you look at USC 300, and we're kicking off at 3.30 in the afternoon in Las Vegas with Devson Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. It's I mean, crazy. <laughs> Early insane. prelims. It's insane. I look. I, I my my good buddy Eric McMahon. You know, there's a lot of people that have been criticizing uh, UFC 300. And, oh, I don't know if this is big enough. He's like, listen to me. He's like, if there was a UFC pay per view that had Alex Bahada versus Jamal Hill as the main event, and then the rest of the main card was Jalen Turner, Hanato Moicano, Jessica Andrade, Marina Rodriguez, Bobby Green, Jim Miller, and Devison Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt, what would you say? You'd be like, that's a damn good pay per view. Bro, those are the early prelims. You know what I mean? Like, th this card is stacked. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Zhang against, uh, uh, how do you say her name? Uh, Yan Zhanan, is that it? Uh, yeah, Yan Zhanan, exactly. And, uh, of course, Gaethje Holloway in the BMF. That's a fun fight. Like, who doesn't want to fucking see that? Um, you know, look, Aljo, I, I don't necessarily think Aljo Main should have been a third fight on the prelims. Uh, I'm biased because I know Aljo and I like him against Calvin Cater. Uh, but then again, Prohovska against uh, Rachik. Is the fucking the main fight of the? I mean, this is one of the best cards I've ever seen. It's insane. I mean, and the, the debut of Kayla Harrison, which I've been a Kayla Harrison fan for a long time, and she's got a really, really tough matchup in Holly Holm, who can easily play spoiler. And then Sadiq Yusuf versus Diego Lopez. I mean, that's an exciting fight. So, I mean, this 300 card is stacked. You know, it, it's, I feel like some fans were like, you know, hey, will, will Habib come back? Will Brock come back? Will Ronda come back? That was, those were never realistic options. You know what I mean? This card no. to me is stacked. I, I, I love it. I, I just don't understand the criticism, to be honest. Habib is Habib, and you would have noticed him training for a fight if he was coming back. But I don't need to, I'm, I don't want to see Brock in the UFC again. I mean, he was very exciting and, you know, respectful to Ronda. I, 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 again, she had an amazing time and I, I loved her and she's responsible for why women's MMA is so successful, but it's like, you know, I, I, I'm, I like who they have now. I mean, the UFC survived and I know we have our next guest the way you're, this is, they survived the exit of Ronda, the, the pretty much fight every three years of Connor and the couple of years at a time exit of John Jones, their biggest talent, Anderson Silva left and they just keep on going. So it's amazing how well they develop, uh, uh, talent and uh, we should bring uh, 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 Dan in. I'm, I'm here yapping because I drank another coffee right before the right before the thing, John. So I apologize to fucking Dan. I got a uh, another really uh, fun and exciting fighter to watch. Uh, nine and one against uh, 
Is it uh, it's, uh, uh, John Matsumoto, who's 14-0, and 0, and uh, this is a great fight. Good to see you. Coming off, we were talking before about how you're coming off of two no contests, and I'm sure you've addressed that a lot. Um, one, one was, hey, uh, 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 the loss... Uh, and one was the one that you should have won. How does that affect you mentally? Has has that played on your mind at all, or is it? Uh, how have you how have you kind of processed that? I'm consistent. <laughs> you're consistent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Consistent or lucky? What do you want to call it? What it is? I think you- uh, for some reason the the MMA world, you know, they evened it out for me. I, you know, I wasn't able to claim that dominant win over Ronnie Lawrence and that loss under miles junk or under miles, you know, I don't necessarily have to claim it on my record. It was the best lesson I've ever learned in the sport. You're uh that miles John, uh, John's fight. That was a great fight. But I, there was a couple of cards at 30-27. I was a little suspect. I, I didn't think 30-27 uh, w- was accurate at all. Uh, you don't care. I don't even care. I lost. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I guess so. But, Dan, so what was the lesson? You said it was the most valuable lesson. So what was the specific lesson you took out of it? Man, after that fight, Cub, you know, we went into that fight. I was a little, I was a little burnt, man. I, that was my third fight of the year. I, you know, after the Ronnie Lawrence thing, they were like, okay, rematching at the end of the month or in a month. And I was like, oh shit, like, dude, it takes a lot for me to make the weight. I was like, man, okay. Jumped right back into camp. You know, it was father's day of the day after the fight. And Cub was like, Hey, go run, you know, go get some of this off, you know, you start camp already. You're not hurt. You're good to go. And two weeks later, when Ronnie turned down the rematch, the UFC was like, all right, well, thank you for, you know, wanting to take the rematch. We got you a fight in six weeks. I'm like, whoa, whoa. So I have enough time to do my shoulder therapy. You know, I kind of went into the camp a little burnt. But all I told myself, you know, I, I follow the same rule. Don't say no to a fight. You know, don't say no to a fight. You never know when it's going to be your last one. You never know if the next fight they're going to give you give you is worse than the original. You know, yeah, man, up, man up. This is what you chose to do, and that's exactly what I did. And honestly, the mantra of the whole camp was, "Don't quit. Don't give up on yourself. Don't quit." During the weight cut, don't quit. During the fight itself, when going into the second round, I I thought he destroyed me. I thought he destroyed me, and I was like, I rewatch it. I'm like. Damn, you idiot. You won that first round. You just need to hop. You know, you had to start pulling that trailer right away. The ball was already rolling. And it it broke me going into the second round where I, I was like, okay, uh, avoid the game plan. Terrible idea on my part. You know, uh, lack of experience on my part. I, uh, I felt like an amateur out there, man. It sucked. Like, I... I wanted to make sure I apologize to you guys for, you know, speaking so highly of me throughout the years of my career and me going out there and kind of not delivering how I should have or how I could have if, if I was all there, you know, on a fresh camp, full camp, you know, and, and after it, the biggest lesson was, all right, you got this far off your grappling, off your wrestling off of just being a damn dog. Now, Cub said, after I, I took a month off after that fight to heal up, and he had me live in one of his houses in Palm Springs to train at the famous Well Diaz Boxing Gym. And I did that. I boxed twice a day, five days a week. I would go see my girl in LA. I would drive to LA on the weekends, hang out with my fiance. Monday, I'll drive right back to the boxing gym. Every day, you know, I'll live there by myself or with a training partner for three months. The first week, I was like, man, this is fun. Second week, damn, I suck at boxing. Third, <laughs> third week, third week, am I getting any better? Fourth week, ooh, 
I think this is impossible. I don't know if I can catch up. Day number 32. I go do MMA sparring back in Orange County. I'm on. Dan, you fixed it. Now keep going. Two more months of that. Dan, now you can hang with now you can hang with any of the guys striking in the sport. Good job. You did it. But that's not the goal. The goal is just to be able to defend enough to make the guy think I want to hurt the shit out of him and start wrestling. Yeah. You know, now he's dead. What did uh, uh Oh, oh sorry, Dan. What did, what did Keith Peterson say to you? I, there was one moment when he walked over after that bad decision. He knew he made a mistake, or he, I guess he had looked at the replay. Uh, did he say anything to you in your corner? Um, I think he just. I think he just said, "Hey, man, I apologize." And that was it. Oh, he did say you were sorry, though. Yeah, and I, I looked at him. I said, "You're human, man. No hard feelings. Got it. You know. Yeah, you, you knew you looked good." The UFC hires the best people in the world to do this, man. Everyone makes mistakes. It was a freak situation. Yeah. I'm over it. I'm over it. It's okay. Dan, you, you mentioned Cub Swanson there. I wanted to ask him, you know, you, you, you're quick to give him a lot of credit. How did that relationship start between you two guys? And, and you know, what would you say he's meant to your career? Because it seems like you're, you're quick to give him a lot of credit for where you are right now. Oh, dude, he found me when I was still, I was coaching wrestling and I was just, you know, partying. I said I wanted to fight. Never in the back of my head, I was, I didn't know if I was ever actually going to do it. I was just, you know, helping fighters with the wrestling. And he didn't give me an out. It was, you're going to, you're going to live with me. You're going to stay in New Mexico. You're going to come back out to my camp. You're going to fight. Dan, what do you think about this guy? And it, it switched my mind to, yeah, let's do it. You like it? I'll, I trust you. Let's do it. You know, Cub got me my first amateur fight, and he's still getting me fights today. We made my UFC debut five years to the weekend from my first amateur fight that he got me. May 3rd. Yep. Um, what do you think of New Mexico? Did it take you a while to adapt to New Mexico? Um. So I... I was before my amateur fight. It was after Cubs, uh, Artem Lobov fight, and we were in Asheville. And I'm like, "All right, what, what now, man?" He goes, "All right, you're gonna come back out to California. You're gonna live with me, and you're gonna fight." And then after my fight, he said, "Okay, you're gonna go to New Mexico and train Ray Borg." And I was like, "Okay." And when I was done training Ray Borg for his DJ fight, I was like, "Okay, Coach Jackson." I'm going back out to California, he goes, nope, actually I already talked to him. You're staying here. You're staying here till you learn how to fight. I stayed there for about three years. A year and a half, two years in, my, uh, my now fiance and I, we planned with all the coaches, the staff, with Cub, my management, our families, that we were going to make the move to L.A. so that she can continue her schooling. And she, uh, she's at USC for dental. So she actually graduates in May as a doctor of dental surgery. And it worked out because I was near Cub for four years. So three years of being in New Mexico, four years of California. Each year that we were in California, I've spent five to six months in New Mexico training. So I, you know, I'm no slouch to being uncomfortable and having to readjust to these camps. So what I'll tell you is like, you know, for being comfortable in New Mexico, I'm as comfortable as I can be. I, I try to take myself out of those comfort zones, man. As soon as I get comfortable, I go switch, go back to California, and I'm like, then I have to restart. As soon as I get comfortable there, okay, back to New Mexico, restart. You know, and it keeps me on my toes, and it, I think it helps me as an athlete. I think it helps me as a man, as a little brother, as a son, as a fiance. I, I think it, it helps me adapt to circumstances so i don't want to say i'm comfortable with it but i learned how to get things done D did your fiance leave la and come stay with you the whole time me when you were in new mexico did, was she wasn't she in la we were, no we were in new mexico together for about oh. three years. oh you and are with her. Those, okay i was spending about five months in california i see okay so i was i'm always flip-flopping 
so now we're actually going to move back to New Mexico in May. So I'll, I'll be with uh, Coach Winkle John, Coach Jackson, and Coach Dominguez full time. And I will continue traveling out to California to train with uh, Bloodline uh, Management. Hello, Dan. You, you know, you talk about, you know, not allowing yourself to get comfortable, putting yourself in uncomfortable places, man. Your social media, I got to be honest, it's inspirational as hell, man. I, I, the, the, the determined as a nickname, I mean, the perfect nickname. But I mean, I guess the, that mindset that you have of like pushing through everything and, and, and putting yourself in these uncomfortable positions, like when did you adapt that? I mean, has that been you from childhood? Was there a moment in your life where, you know, everything kind of clicked? Like, when did you adapt that mindset that you have that, as I said, People should follow you on social media, get it, because it's inspirational as hell. The moment happened when I realized there were people like Gene Matsumoto out there. That's when it happened. And that happened as soon as I started the sport, when I realized, man, I wasn't the best wrestler, most skilled. I, my career, I didn't have the best head movement. I didn't have the best hands. I, I wasn't always the fastest. I'm the damn strongest i know that i'm the strongest bantamweight in the world i know that for a fact but like you know these skills once i found that out i said man i can work on it but these guys some of them have gifts that i don't you know what they don't have they don't have a full life i have a full life i don't get excuses i don't allow myself to have any excuses because I, the people I keep around me allow me to work as hard as I want. I make sure that I keep people around me that push me constantly. And once I realized that, that's where that's where the drive came from to work hard. It was, I have to. I don't have the same body as a John Jones. I don't got the speed of a Matsumoto. I didn't have the experience of starting MMA at eight years old like him. But where he, these guys lack is I wouldn't say they lack the, everyone, everyone in this sport works hard. Right. But where I know I drown people is at the deep end of that pool. Yep. Yeah. Your cardio is unbelievable. Um, and, and you're relentless, like watching you, you just seem like a nightmare to deal with. Uh, you're always going for take just a relentless. Um, and I guess I'm sure you can feel at one point, when someone is tired and there's nothing worse than somebody who just won't stop. It's like watching Marab. Like nobody wants to fucking deal with Marab because yeah. he just doesn't stop moving. He doesn't stop. Uh, do you ever feel people break? Uh, meaning, can you feel deep into the, uh, in the third round or late into the second round where you can just kind of feel, um, and then I'm not questioning their heart, but can you just feel their ability to resist you break a little bit by that point? So this is a, I've, I've never really thought of this. I've never been asked this. Um, I'm surprised I've never been asked that, but you know how they, uh, how in sports they tell you, you don't focus on the, the, your adversary, focus on yourself, you know, keep your eyes on your own paper, freaking work on yourself. Yeah. Even in the fight, I do that. I, my gauge is, Okay, if I'm tired, this guy's dying. I, Cub always says that's why I'm an issue, because I, I live for that. I live to train tired. I, one of my last sparring in California, they had me do. You know, I do three hard rounds and we go home. Three hard rounds, and if I feel like I screwed up, my coaches say, "Nope, you're done. You're." Next week, you get to worry about that. Make the changes. you got a week. But this practice, they're like, okay, you're going to do four, five, and six after I already blew my load in three rounds. And I was like, okay. The fourth round, you know, I, I Cub does so well at making us take care of each other in the room. But once I started dominating a guy, this guy in the fourth round, I was just pitter-pattering his face on top, you know, just staying active, you know, looking for him to make an opening. And he wasn't opening up, so I just kept on tapping him, tapping him, tapping him. And they're telling me, Dan, come on, you got to get the finish tonight. He wasn't opening up. I kept going. At the end of the round, I rolled off this dude and threw up all over the mat and started laughing. I still had two <laughs> rounds to go. But I started laughing because this guy's dying. 
he's dying. But I made sure that I pushed myself to, okay, I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm going to pay for that. I'm going to pay for that. I'm going to push so hard that I know that if this was real and I was trying to hurt you, I'm throwing up in your face because I'm so damn tired. <laughs> no, you're dead. And, you know, stuff like that, like, that's where I get that, that drive in the fight where I'm like, I'm not worried if you're tired. I know you're tired. My gauge is how tired am I? If I'm dead, you're, you're done. You know, and as soon as I feel that, now I start laughing. Now I start having fun. Now when I get in these positions where I'm relaxed, this guy is, he wants his way up. I'm, yeah. I'm, at least I'm not in the gym throwing up. I'm I, good to go. I, I told you the determined was the right nickname for you, man. They got that right. So, Hey, talk about this matchup, right? Matsumoto, you said a couple, it sounds like you have a lot of respect for him. I and mean, obviously he brings that perfect Heck record yeah. to the cage. Sounds like you got a lot of respect. So what do you think about him as an opponent? Kind of what he presents to you out there. So uh, I'm maybe you're familiar with, uh, my LFA career. After or before the ultimate fighter, you know, during the beginning of COVID LFA, when they had their first show, man, there were no slouches fighting. Only the toughest of the tough were willing to fight. You know, those, the toughest of the tough were training through everything. The toughest of the tough were training and not working or training full time. My first fight, I, uh, during COVID, I fought Jackson Fielho, black belt, and we had a war. My first time going to war for three rounds. The guy made me, he looked like an action figure. I looked like a Barbie doll compared to him. <laughs> You know, it was wild and I got it done. And then Ultimate Fighter happened. And then I fought a, a fight to get my feet wet after the show. And then they gave me my first real challenge, which it was an undefeated 10 and 0 Brazilian with plenty of knockouts. They called him the next Anderson Silva. What did I do to him? I was so fired up that everyone thought I was going to lose that. When I was on him during that fight, I was foaming at the mouth, literally. My coaches, they were looking at me, and they were like, Dan, so, no, you're good. Just do it again. They paused during the rounds. They are like, you're good. You're fine. Keep going. And I was like, okay. And I, the third round, I'm on top of this dude. And I told the ref backstage, I'm like, hey, this kid's only 20 years old, man. If you see him taking too much damage, please do not make me keep going. I asked the referee. I, I asked him. And he's like, oh, I got you. No worries. No worries. And I'm like, okay, man. Third round, I'm on top of Santos firing off elbows. And I'm, I wasn't even trying to hurt him. I was just putting volume, almost like a training partner. At this point, I knew he was dead because I was pretty tired. I was foaming at the mouth and I'm hitting him, hitting him, I'm elbowing him, elbowing him. And I'm, I'm looking at the ref. I'm like, you could watch the video on my, or on my Instagram. I'm saying, you said you wouldn't do this to him. And the ref pulls me off and I yelled at the ref and I'm like, do it. And then just that fight alone, I'm like, I've been in there with the stud. I've been in there with the kid that's supposed to beat me. I, I know what it feels like. Yeah, I, I love these Brazilians. I have so many Brazilian friends, and I love the battle they bring. That's why I respect Matsumoto so much. I love that they like war. I like war. This is great, you know. But my mindset right now is I'm his first American, all-American, life-born freaking stud of a wrestler I'm a, I'm a monster for this kid you know and, and it it reminds me of uh you know ufc one i i'm i constantly have this shirt out on my uh suitcase of of ufc one to remember you know yeah i did all the boxing work and everything i ain't trying to beat this kid in boxing i ain't trying to beat him in kickboxing i'm not trying to make it pretty i'm, I'm trying to fight him out. I, I want to fight. I want to, I want to dominate him so that it feels like that Myron fight where everyone who thought everyone, all the keyboard warriors that seen this, everyone who 
loves the contender series understands that there's levels to this. I've been wrestling longer than he's been alive. Right. Great fight, Dan. Um, looking forward to this man, uh, John Matsumoto, uh, welcoming him to the UFC. And um, really good talking to you, man. Really, you're interesting, and I uh, hope to have you back on. It's good talking to you. Oh, it was awesome. To- I was excited to talk to you. You know that? Finally, they gave me the media where I'm like, I got to talk to these guys. No one really knows my mindset. They see my social media, and they just say, oh, wow, this kid works hard. I think one of my issues is I think I'm a little too smart for myself sometimes. But I use it to my advantage where I can – I can understand where uh, where people aren't as strong as me, and it, uh, you know I use it to my advantage. Like I said, have a great fight on Saturday. Um, really, really exciting matchup, and uh, we'll definitely talk to you again. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Dan. Take care. Jim, that's some that's some that's some low key savage trash talk, right? Like I've heard guys yeah. that are in the back before where they talk to the referee and they're like, "Hey, man, if it looks like I'm in trouble, just let me go out on my shield. Don't stop it for me too early." I've heard a lot of guys say that. I don't know if I've ever heard somebody tell the referee like, "Look, man, don't make me permanently disfigure this young gentleman <laughs> on the other side of the cage." Man, promise that's me confidence. you'll step in there. <laughs> and and he is a it. tough fight again. Uh, you know, Matsumoto fourteen zero, but again against a guy. There's, I don't care who the people are. There's always a UFC. Again, even if you're coming in like Chandler or Gaethje, already an established star, there's still something about it. I just asked this to, uh, oh, God, who the fuck did we just, uh, who did we just interview on? Uh, he just beat uh, Kevin Holland. Oh, my God. I'm fucking Oh, Michael spacing. Page? Oh, Michael, Michael uh, Venom Page, yeah. Um, yep. Just talking about coming into the UFC as an established person and feeling that. So when you're coming in and you're not on that level, there's no way you don't feel it. And you have to deal with a guy like this, a guy who wants to drag you down to the floor, who's going to have his fucking head in your hips the whole time, trying to single leg you, trying to double. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's a very hard fight for this uh, uh, Matsumoto coming in. So look, John. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'll say it is, and it's and it's good to hear Dan embrace who he is. You know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. I think you hear guys, well, ah, oh, my box. You know, he said, look, I'm trying to improve my boxing, but not because I'm trying to be a boxer. Like, I know what I am. I know what got me to the show. And I think sometimes people forget kind of what got him there. And so I love the fact that he just embraces who he is, embraces what he's best at, and, uh, you know, I think that's going to make him successful. So, listen, like we, we touched on it. Everybody's talking about USC 300, but there are some fun fights on this card this weekend. Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson yeah. could be an absolute brawl. Trevor Peak versus Charlie Campbell I'm looking forward to as well. So, you know, it's totally understandable if this was flying under the radar when you got the massive USC 300 on the horizon. But I do think there's going to be some fun matchups this weekend at the Apex. Yep, starts 3 o'clock Eastern on ESPN+, Plus, and the main card starts 6 p.m., which I love, love, love these early fights because uh, I work at night, so I can watch yep. these and then go to work. Uh, ESPN+, Plus, 6 p.m., Allen versus Curtis, too. Um, so, yeah, don't just skip over this one to get to 300. There's some really great fights on the card. And, John, what do you want to promote? Where can people hear your podcast, and where can people keep up with you? Hey, yeah, definitely check me out on social media. John Morgan underscore MMA. We'll link it out there. Uh, this Thursday night, Fury Professional Grappling 9 will be on USC Fight Pass as well. We'll be out in Georgia at the Air National Guard base there putting on some grappling matches. So check that out. Uh, and uh, and then obviously next weekend, USC 300. But don't forget CFFC 131 as well on Friday night on USC Fight Pass. So a lot of, a lot of fun stuff with the CFFC family coming up as well. Thank you, John. And uh, tonight, if you want to see me, uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m., I'm at the Fat Black Pussycat doing an hour. And uh, I have a new video up uh, with my wife on our YouTube page for anybody that wants to see my fucking miserable married life. And uh, always good talking to you, man. I pre- appreciate you so much being here. You're, you're uh, great to have on. Thanks for having me, brother. Anytime. All right. Talk to you soon. John Morgan. Thank you, buddy. <laughs>